our group is interested in making the Wally robot a real-world thing instead of just a sci-fi or cartoon movie. Welcome to my office. My name is Chen Feng. I'm a, a assistant professor at Tendon School of Engineering at NYU. I work on robotics, computer vision, machine learning, and their applications in construction and manufacturing industries. I usually use this example to explain the problem that I am working on and I'm interested in, which is our group is interested in making the Wally robot a real-world thing instead of just a sci-fi or cartoon movie. The Wally robot often needs to move a cube from one place to another place and then build structures. During this process, the robot itself is actually actively modifying the environment. The shape, the structure, the appearance of the environment is being actively modified by these robots. But at the same time, the robot needs to know its own position and orientation in order to make sure the structure it builds is actually the the structure a human wants it to build. This is not as simple as, oh, we can just connect the robot to a GPS and then solve the problem. First of all, GPS have not enough accuracy to support this kind of task. Usually the commercially available GPS that we have on our cell phone or smartphone is of meter level accuracy for localization and that's naturally not enough to, uh, for a lot of this kind of task. It's not even enough for enabling a self-driving car because the lanes are at meter level. So if you need to accurately change lanes, you really need to know at uh, decimeter level accuracy for the positioning. And another thing is, if we don't use GPS, we use some of the classic robotic solution called SLAM, simultaneously localization and mapping. These methods usually assume the environment is mostly static or it is an environment that a robot has visited before, so it has built a uh, representation that we call as a map that represents this environment. For the Wally problem that I just mentioned, it is actually changing this map. It is changing this environment, so um, it needs to both know its own position and orientation, um, and also know this while it is modifying the environment. And this localization and the modification, these two things are coupled, it's interdependent. So if you make some mistake in one side, it's going to affect the other side and vice versa. And this makes this problem very challenging and there's no known existing solution that can solve this problem accurately. We're building our own robots that can move and also can have a, a manipulator on this mobile robot so it can manipulate, can pick up a, a box and, and then uh, drop it at different locations. Right now, first try to implement it in a, in a lab settings and then bring it out to, to outdoors to perform tasks like bricklaying. What is special about this uh, project is we want to use very low-cost sensors, just cameras, and eventually we, we want to be able to demonstrate similar capabilities that Wally is able to do. So that's one area, and we have several projects, one, several for mobile robots, and one for helping people with blind, uh, blindness or low vision. The specific technical solution that uh, we are improving is called visual place recognition or VPR. The technology is trying to mimic how human recognize and localize where we ourselves are. The idea is if you have been to some place before, we as humans, we will build a cognitive map of that environment. You will remember certain features like the billboard uh, or some text in this environment. All these features are very useful for yourself to uh, relocalize yourself next time when you come to the same environment. We are working on this VPR technology to enable robots to achieve the same capabilities. Even in an indoor environment where we don't have GPS or in an environment like Manhattan where sometimes GPS goes crazy, we can depend on this kind of computer vision based solutions that try to match us what the camera is observing right now versus a reference database that stores all the images, features of the environment that you have visited before. And once you are able to uh, make a match, then you would 
know, okay, I have been to this place before and I, I can anticipate where to go next in order to reach my navigation uh, destination. This kind of solution is helpful for mobile robots, for self-driving cars, and also for people with low vision or blindness. So this is one big group of projects that we're working on right now with several PhD students and collaborating with engineering school and also School of Medicine at NYU. We are actually deploying this technology and testing it in Thailand, in the University of Thailand, as an international uh, academic collaboration where they have a lot of students with blindness or low vision. As a part of the NIH project that we're working on, is trying to piloting this technology and see if it can really help people. Maybe another project that I can talk about is internally what we call as Mapping NYC. We're building this sensor box, including both cameras and laser scanners, LiDAR sensors, together. It's very low cost. The total cost of this device is like less than 5K, and we can install it on any cars. So we go to rent cars and put the sensor box on the car, and then we drive around in New York, and then the collected data is able to build the map of the whole city. Something like the street view that you all probably use on Google Map, but then we want to make this open source available for researchers and educational purposes. And this large scale data set will enable lots of different applications like navigation and many other research tasks that people in AI and robotics are uh, interested in. Talking about AI and robotics, people are always concerned about whether this is going to replace or reduce the number of jobs available to human workers. When we develop or choose the topics to work on, we usually do not want to eliminate human out of the picture. So for example, there are certain tasks that are, is actually quite difficult for a robot to do. And that there are certain tasks that human actually doesn't want to do because it's repetitive, it's boring, it's uh, dangerous, right? For this kind of task, right now we have to have human to do that because we just don't have the technical capability to do it. So when we choose to work on a uh, robotics task, we uh, typically choose to work on these kind of problems or at least we use these kind of problems to motivate our research instead of um, eliminating humans. One simple example in a manufacturing scenario is you have robot picking up sound heavy objects and then human pick up some delicate tools and perform the more contact rich operations for example tightening bolts or nuts this is not so easy for a robot I mean, it's actually creating more opportunities or new opportunities new type of jobs to work with human same thing for for ai